Hey, you're also blonde. Okay, let's go for it. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Huh. Well. So many things to say. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. I thank you for these students. We thank you for CFAS not being here. Help us to enjoy this lecture and help us to understand the math together. In your name prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh-huh. <clears throat> <laughs> Definition. So last time I talked about the order of a zero. I'm now going to talk about the uh, corresponding result at infinity. So let f be an analytic function on some exterior domain. So z beyond some circle um, for some r greater than 0. All right. Then if f is not identically 0, for that exterior domain, um, then we say f has a 0 of order n at infinity. What? Um, if g of w, which is defined to be f of 1 over w, has a 0 of order n at w equal to 0. So this is pretty much the same game we've played before at infinity, right? Um, let me give you an example. So let's see here. How about, um, let's see, how about sine f of z equals to the sine of 1 over z? So basically, this is what? This is 1 over z um, minus 1 over 3 factorial, 1 over z cubed, right? Plus dot dot dot. So it looks to me like it's going to be, this is going to be something with a 0 of order 1 at infinity. That's a simple 0. But let me, you know, let me run through the definition. So what's g of w for this one? f of 1 over w is sine of 1 over 1 over w, <laughs> which is sine w, right? And that has a simple 0 at w equals 0. How do I know that? Note g of 0 is equal to sine of 0, which is 0. And g prime of 0 is equal to cosine of 0, which is 1. So therefore, by definition, it's a simple 0, right? It's a 0 of order 1. Hence, f of z has a 0, also a simple 0, at infinity. All right. <clears throat> These examples, uh, this next example is kind of neat. Um, let's see here. So look at f of z, 1 over 1 minus z cubed. So if you look at this intuitively, what happens if z is huge? It's, it should pivot like side to side, no? Yeah, oh, you're fine, okay. <coughs> <coughs> so if you think about z being huge, this is essentially just 1 over z cubed, right? I mean, if z is, is absolutely gargantuan, right? Intuitively speaking, this should be like 1 over z cubed, right? So we expect that this has a 0 of order 3 at infinity. Let me, let me show you. A, let me, that's, that's just an intuitive argument, right? So um, look at g of w. I mean, you could either look at g of w, or you could look at f of, um, you could try to expand f in 1 over z. It's kind of the same thing, but I'll, I'll follow the definition, the g. So g of w is f of 1 over w, which is what? 
1 over 1 minus 1 over w cubed. And if you multiply this by w cubed over w cubed, you get w cubed over, <coughs> excuse me, you get minus w cubed over, oh, fine, 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 w cubed minus 1. That's almost geometric, but I need to factor out a minus 1, right? So um, this is equal to minus w cubed over 1 minus w cubed, which is equal to the sum um, k equals 0 to infinity of w cubed. Well, excuse me, it's w cubed. There's a minus out front, right? So times w um, to the w cubed to the what? to the k power, right, in this geometric series. That's only going to be good for what? For the modulus of w less than 1, right? Um, so anyway, what do we have? We got um, uh, minus the sum k equals um, 0 to infinity. Um, w to the 3k plus plus 3, right? Which I could rewrite as what? I could rewrite this as, um, you know, minus w cubed, um, minus w to the fourth, minus w to the fifth, and so forth, right? And you can factor out a what? You can factor out a minus w cubed, right? You can factor out minus w cubed, and you'd be left with 1 plus w plus w squared plus da 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 da. And then by the theorem I proved last time, we've written it as what? The sum of, we've written it as, you know, w to the n. This is like, this is like w to the n times h of w with h of 0 equals to 1 not equal to 0, right? I mean, n is equal to 3 here. So this shows that it's a what? This shows g is, has a 0 of order 3 at w equal to 0. Hence, f has a 0 of order 3 at infinity. Which you, we could see just direct. If you don't want to do this silly g function thing, you could just like work directly with f anyway. Like You could just look at f of z and rewrite it in terms of 1 over z. To do that, what would I do? How would I just directly work with f to show that it's has a 0 of order 3 at infinity, skipping the g function. How would, I, how would I do that? I just basically divide both the top and the bottom by z cubed, right? So I got like 1 over z cubed over, I mean minus 1 over z cubed. So that gives me a, a 1 minus 1 over z cubed, right? Which is 1 over z cubed with a minus times the sum of 1 over z to the 3k, k equals 0 to infinity. In other words, it's minus 1 over z cubed times 1 plus 1 over z cubed. Ooh, I think I did that wrong. You guys didn't call me on it either. Come on, guys. Let me get away with this. Thank you. That's better. There we go. <clears throat> anyway, this you can also see that it has a 0 of order 3 at infinity from this expression. In other words, there's, a, there's an analog of the theorem I showed you last time about factoring out an analytic function um, times you know, z minus z naught to the n. Here you, you factor out a, a Laurent series and um, a particular pole. Let me project that because I'm starting to get low on energy. I was hoping to write this lecture, but I just have to admit I don't have the necessary energy today. And I'm only like 10 minutes into this thing, right? Class nap time. <laughs> Come on. Come to life.
What did you say, Lorenzo? I was saying someone needs to invent an alarm clock that like produces a spike <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. in your bed uh -huh. so that you have serious incentive and motivation to get out of bed in the morning. Ah. Uh. <laughs> well, that's the nice thing about children, is they will wake you up. They will just jump on you. Um, okay, so this is what we went through last time. Um, the, um, the factor theorem for power series, right, that um, if we have a zero of order n, then we can factor out z minus z naught to the n power times h of z, right? So the corresponding result for um, infinity is what I was going over right now. That theorem translates into the following. If f of z is the analytic function with zero of order n at infinity, then you can write it as a sub n times over z minus z naught to the n plus a sub n plus 1, and so forth and so on. Now, if you look at that, you could factor out and a 1 over z minus z naught to the n power, and it'd be left with like a constant plus a reciprocal and z minus z naught and so forth and so on, like what you're just looking at. So to totally analogous to um, what I was just saying. But this is also if and only if, by the way. I mean, like if, if the power, if the function has a series expansion, a Laurent series expansion like that, then it also means like if I have this, I can immediately read off from this that we have a 0 of order 3 at infinity. OK. I mean, that, that's just, it's immediately evident from that expression, <clears throat> is all I was trying to say. The, um, there's this example. So like, here's the, here's the, here's the uh, extension. So we did it for like a cube. Here's z minus z naught to the n power. This is, I, I got this from Gamelin. Here he shows that you can rewrite that using this like sneaky little geometric series argument as 1 over z to the n times this thing, right? So this thing. Um, is, is, is this is a analytic at infinity, um, and its value is 1 at infinity, right? I mean, you can kind of just see that intuitively speaking. If I plug infinity to this, I get 0 plus da, da, 0 plus 0 plus 0, and I get a 1 here, right? So all of the um, thing which is 0 at infinity is captured in this 1 over z, 1 over z to the n power. So this function also has a 0 of order n at infinity. It's kind of a, a generalization of our previous example. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this paragraph is kind of important. If you look at the examples that we've covered so far in this section, you might notice that if we have f of z is analytic at z naught, then if it has a 0 at z naught, right, then it has to be a finite order, right? Well, I can, it seems like there are two cases. Either it has finite order or it's identically 0. I mean, that's a possibility. The function could just be identically 0 near z naught and have a 0 at z naught. But we rule that out in the definition of a 0 of order n, right? We say, suppose f is not identically 0. We set that case aside as a special case. Functions which are identically 0, that, that's a different, different ballgame. So here's the theorem. If d is a domain and f is an analytic function on d, what's a domain? an open, connected set, right? Then f is an analytic function on d, which is not identically 0, OK? Then the zeros of f are isolated points in d. Um, I think this also gives us that the zeros are a finite order, although I haven't written that in the theorem. but. OK, so this, this argument is an interesting argument. I'm going to talk you through it. Um, there's an argument like this before that I skipped over because we ran short on time. But basically, the structure of this argument is we're going to look at a particular set. All right? We're going to show that this set is both um, is, is open, and we're going to show that its complement is, is open. But the union of these two sets covers the whole domain D. All right, and these, these sets, by the way, are disjoint. There's no intersection between them. So if they were both non-trivial, if they were both non-empty sets, then we'd have a separation of D, which would violate the fact that D is connected. Because if D is connected, you can't separate it into two open sets, which are disjoint. That's, 
essentially the definition of connected. Well, if that's the topological definition of connected, that's an implication of path connected, which we took as the definition of connected. It's not hard to see. If you could, if you could take a set, right, and you can put it into two pieces which are disjoint, then there's no way you can draw, there's no way you can get a path that goes from one to the other without leaving the totality of the, 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 the bigger set, right? I mean, so path connected implies connected. Um, okay, so here's, a, here's the set, U. We look at the set U that's defined to be all the points in the domain for which the mth derivatives of Z are zero for M zero, one, two, three, all the way on out. Basically, it's a set of points um, for which <coughs> this given function has zero derivatives to all orders. Okay? Um, so, of course, uh, that would include, um, well, it wouldn't, I mean, if, if you just had the function with zero, but its first derivative was non-zero, then that point wouldn't be included in u, right? For a point to be included in the set u, we have to have the, the value of the function to be zero, the first derivative, the second derivative, all the derivatives to be zero. That's, the, that's what it takes to be in the set u. So suppose you have a point, z naught and u, right? Then that means that the kth derivative at z naught divided by k factorial is zero, right? But hey, f is analytic, so it converges to its Taylor expansion, right? So hence, f of z is equal to k equals 0 to infinity, a sub k, z minus z naught to the k, but hey, a sub k is this, right, which is 0. So f of z is equal to 0. Thus, f of z vanishes on an open disk um, in d of z naught, right? And that means then that the kth derivative of f is 0, not just at z naught, but at all points close to z naught in this open disk. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the open disk d of z naught is actually a subset of u. But z naught was an arbitrary point in u, so that shows that each point in u is, is an interior point. Consequently, u is open. Are we good? Now, you'd look at the complement of u in the domain d, all right? D, d with all the points in u removed. Pick a point in there. Pick z naught in, in a point, a point in the, the complement, right? There must be some n greater than 0 such that the nth derivative at z naught is not equal to 0, right? If all of the coefficients are not 0, there must be at least one coefficient which is non-zero, right? So it then follows that f of z, which is this, is not the, you know, it's not identically zero, right? Um, I mean, of course, if you put z equals to z naught here, this formula comes back to zero, but um, it's not the zero function anyway, because there is at least one coefficient which is not zero. So it follows then that there's a disk, right, d of z naught centered on, at z naught, on which f of z is not equal to zero for each, for each z. <coughs> Because when z minus z naught is not equal to 0, that's non-zero. But the coefficient, the nth coefficient, is non-zero, right? So those go together to give you something non-zero. Um, thus, that disk is a subset of v. And this shows that v is an open set. So there you go. You have u is open. The complement of u is open. But since d is connected, it only, the only possibilities are that u is the empty set or u is equal to d. Now, if u is the empty set, then um, what would that mean? Well, let's see, what, what if u is equal to d? Well, if u equals equal to d, that would say that f of z is equal to 0 for all z and d, which would mean that f is identically 0, which we don't allow, right? Because that's assumed that f is not identically 0, I think. Yeah, right here. So that's not possible. So it must be the other case u is empty. If u is empty, what's that mean? Look at the set u. What does it mean for u to be empty? There is no such point, right? There's no point in the domain where all of the derivatives are 0. In other words, you can't have a 0 of infinite order if you were to define such a thing. So the zeros have to be of finite order, right? 
Now, once you know they're a finite order, we can go back to the result we proved last class, basically. Um, because if the, if the zero has finite order, then we can use theorem 5.79 to expand the function as the product of an analytic function, which is non-zero at z naught and z minus z naught, right? But <clears throat> if there was another zero close by, right? I mean, if this is non-zero at a point, it can be non-zero. You can find that it's non-zero at all points close to that point because the power series of h of z extends past the point. And the power series is not, not zero. So if it's non-zero at a point, it's non-zero close to that point for some disk. Consequently, you can't get another zero except for the only zero is, is z naught really close to z naught because this h of z is non-zero. Here's a more careful rendition of what I just said. But so there you go. The I zeros are, are then isolated, right? There has to be some distance between zeros of an analytic function that's not identically zero. Consequently, <coughs> excuse me, if f and g are analytic on a domain, and if you have f of z is equal to g of z for each z belonging to some set which has a non-isolated point, right? Um, you could call that set the coincidence set, where f and z, f of z, f of z and g of z coincide. Um, if that's the case, then f of z is equal to g of z for all z in the domain. So if I have, if I have some domain, here's my domain, whatever it could have holes in it. Right? So here's my domain D, right? If I have some subset of that, <clears throat> and let's see, what are, what are, what are, what are examples of, of subsets of this domain D which have a non-isolated point? How about a line segment? Does that have a non-isolated point? Yes, in fact, every point on this line segment is non-isolated. For example, the real line Every point in the real line is non-isolated because if you take an open disk around any point in the real line, you have infinitely other, many other points in the real line in that disk. There does not exist some radius in which you can isolate the point. Right? There's always more real numbers close to any real number. <coughs> How about uh, I mean, I mean, this would be fine. I mean, you, 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 any, pretty much any, any kind of like finite curve you can think of would be a set with a set with a non-isolated point. You could also have one of these deals. You get the idea? <laughs> it's enough to have one point which is not isolated in the set. That one point, if you have f of z is equal to g of z on any of these green sets I've written, it forces f of z to be equal to g of z on the whole domain. Isn't that weird? I mean, to me, that's very, very shocking that that little piece of data, that f of z and g of z coincide there, is enough to make them coincide on the whole domain. Now, what's the precondition? Um, I do. I'm, I am assuming that f and g are analytic. Okay. Now that's a big. That's a big thing. If you don't a priori know that I mean, before the fact, know that f and g are analytic. If you just have two functions, any old complex functions that agree on some coincidence set, and then you do not get to conclude that they have to be equal on the domain. It may not even be able. It may not be possible to extend them to be analytic functions on the domain. There's no guarantee of that. So the precondition of this theorem is that they're both analytic. That's important to notice. But the proof is just look at the coincidence set. And if you do that, you can look at h of z, which is f of z minus g of z, right? And so if h of z is not identically 0 on d, then the existence of c contradicts our previous theorem, right? since C is by definition a set with a non-isolated zeros for H of Z. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Oh, goodness gracious. Now, an extension of this is 
if you have a domain and you have a, e, a subset of the domain that has an unisolated point, you can kind of do it with, um, what's the game he's playing here? He's, he's fixing one complex variable and, and working with the other one. So w is fixed and f of zw is analytic in z with w fixed. Um, he says if f of zw is equal to zero whenever z and w are in e, e is a, a set with a non-isolated point, right? Then f of zw is equal to zero for all z and w and d. So here's an extension of the result to two, two variables, basically. All right. Again, I would point out the, you know, the really neat application of this is just the problem of extending our favorite functions from calculus from real calculus. Since the real line is chocked full of non-isolated points, if you have a function which is real analytic, right? In other words, if it's complex analytic on the real line, then, um, you know, if there is some function on the whole complex plane, which is holomorphic, right, which is analytic on the whole complex plane, and it restricts to the function that's given on the real line, there's only one such possibility, right? But again, the possibility of extending the complex function off the, off the given coincidence set or whatever that ha you need to know that from something else. Let me, let me, so that's really what analytic continuation is about. Um, we're getting there. This, um, this was a very vexing issue because, so b basically what we just, you know, what we just said, right, basically is when two things coincide, they have to be, to be equal. It gives you this principle of permanence of identity. And um, this is, you know, it was a very, difficult thing to understand, um, you know, for, for, for 18th century mathematicians. Here, here's, for example, the, an example of Euler wrestling with this issue for the logarithm. We see, therefore, that it is essential to the nature of logarithms that each number have an infinity of logarithms and that all these logarithms be different, not only from one another, but also different from the logarithms of every other number. I mean, he's trying to extend the, the regular logarithm to the rest of the complex plane, right? And like that problem of extending the logarithm to the rest of the complex plane is very vexing because it seems like as you extend it to the rest of the complex plane, you don't get a holomorphic function. In fact, you get little log of z, which is not a function, it's multiply valued, right? So as you try to like extend from a given set of values off that set, it can be very complicated. Um, all right, so <clears throat> let me put this away. I'm going to try to draw some pictures. Ah, go away. Go away. <sighs> All right. I'm going to try. Oh, no. What is, what, that say? what is the prime minister up to? So I will attempt to tell you guys something meaningful about an analytic continuation today. I'm not, I'm not overly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those topics that I will discuss, but we don't really f fully expand on, OK? <laughs> Pun intended. So the basic idea is something like this. Given you know, f of z equals to the sum, um, say k equals 0 to infinity, um, a sub k times z minus z naught right, to the k. So you start at some point z naught, right? What's the domain of such a function? We proved this. Again, I'm defining the function by the series, to be clear. We know what it is, right? It's some kind of disk, right? Now, what I don't know, what's rather complicated and subtle, is the possible behavior at the edge of the disk, right? The circle at radius r. We call this R naught, right? I mean, who knows? 
what happens at that circle. It could be that all points are excluded. Um, for example, just to give you a sense of that, just to, oh, come on, where'd it go? Yeah, here's, here's an example. Just, you know, some cautionary tales. If you look at g of z equal to z plus z squared plus z to the fourth plus z, you see where it's doing. What's the next one? <laughs> okay, very good. This has radius of convergence r equals to 1. And in Ramir, he proves that the uh, even and odd roots of unity are dense. Um, that, well, that he, he proves that G of Z approaches infinity if you approach any even root of unity. And um, he also shows that the even or odd roots of unity are dense on the unit circle. And consequently, the function G of Z is unbounded at each point on the unit circle. So the unit circle is what's called the natural boundary of this function. So like if you, if you, this fun, what, what is the given function centered where? Zero, right? So z not zero. The, um, the radius is one. <clears throat> and it's called a natural boundary every single point. Um, every single point on the unit disk is actually outside the domain in this example. Um, if you look at page 125 of my notes, um, I then mention if you look at basically the, uh, the alternating series, right? This one. Um, I think it's important to have a couple examples in front of you because otherwise if I just start talking about this hypothetically, it won't make as much sense. We need to have some sense of what can happen um, for different series. Minus one to the k minus one over k z to the k. In other words, this is 1 over z minus 1 over z squared plus da da da. This one, right, so I mean if I draw, let me just, let me, me, me fill in the, the singular points, the points which <clears throat> the series diverges. It's on the whole, basically the whole unit circle, dense uh, collection of singular points for the series there. This one, again, the radius of convergence is 1. But um, for this one, um, it converges for each z except which one? There's just one point this doesn't converge, actually. For all modulus of z equals to 1, except what? Mm, well, <laughs> um, um, oh my goodness gracious, this is totally bogus. Don't give it. Yeah, you're right, 0. This expression totally blows up at 0. You don't need a course of complex analysis to know that, right? Um, this is <laughs> 1. Um, good grief. This is z minus z squared over 2 plus z cubed over 3, right? I mean, that's what I've written, not, not what I, come on. So there's just, there's just one, actually, if you study it carefully, there's just one singular point on the radius of convergence one on the unit circle. What is it? So that's, that's the singular point for that series. There are tons of other things that can happen. Uh, Ramir, Ramir tells us that Lu Lucin in 1911 found a series that is of the form sum over ck z to the k. It diverges at every point except for one. There is an example which diverges on the whole stupid unit circle except for one. I mean, pretty much the sky's the limit in terms of weird stuff you can make happen for singular points on the edge of the vesicle uh, convergence. All right, so what I'm trying to tell you is we don't know, after, I mean, for a general series, what's going to happen on this circle. 
okay? But what you can do is you can go, okay, well, I'm not content with this. I want to find out what does this thing look like if I go over here, you know, at Z1. And so I can basically take this, this power series and I can recenter it over here at Z1, right? And I'll be able to find some other um, R1, which I'll draw like this. Like that. Well, that was supposed to be a circle. Oh well, I tried. I'm going to move it. There, it's more like a circle there. Okay, so R1, right? And so basically, uh, I have that. And you could call this F sub naught because it's the initial thing, right? So I could say F sub naught of Z is equal to F sub 1 of Z which is the sum over b, let's say sub k, or I guess I could say a sub k um, 1, I don't know, I mean, whatever notation you want to use for this, I'll use b's. Um, there's a better notational scheme in the notes, which I'll project here in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to write these out so we can kind of get a better sense of what's going on here. Oh, z1, right? So you can recenter the series at z1 such that these are equal on the overlap. Now this, this has some radius that this is a series, right? It converges for some radius of convergence r1. And if, I'm, if the point z1 is inside the disk of convergence of the initial point, then there has to be some kind of like overlapping region, right? And so this is this is the z this is this is the z i'm talking about here they have to match on the overlap right but it's kind of like a drug once you get started it's hard to stop right and then you can take oh i'm sorry well the cfaws aren't here so it's safe for me to say that um what's that oh drugs are bad don't do drugs <laughs> You know, so then you can take a Z2, right? And then maybe that one has a disk of convergence like this. I don't know. And you can, you can just keep doing this. And then they will match on the overlap, right? And this process of creating new functions by continuing the domain by recentering the power series from the original domain is called analytic continuation. Yes, sir? So for each of the... <clears throat> In my picture, it does, but it doesn't have to. For example, the radius can get bigger. Let me show you that. So consider f sub naught of z, let's say, equal to sum k equals 0 to infinity, um, z over 2 to the kth power, right? So what's the radius of convergence for this? <clears throat> Apply, well, hey, how about, oh, this is a geometric series, right? So this is geometric series with what? The radius being z over 2, right? So this converges when? Modulus of z less than 2, right? So my initial disk um, centered at 0, right? z naught is equal to 0. And we got this disk of radius, radius 2, right? What was, what, 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 let's, let's think about recentering it, right? Let's recenter, let's, let's try to recenter it over here at say z1 equals to minus 1. So how would, how would we do that? I mean, there are two ways to do it. 
Okay, so the one way to do it would be to say f1 of z is equal to basically the sum k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k, right? Um, z plus 1 minus 1 to the k, right? So what I do, I just invented, you know, I just in basically recentered it, and but it comes at a cost. I have to subtract one, right? But then you go binomial theorem on this thing. What does it give you? <coughs> one over two to the k, sum n equals zero to k, n choose k. Um, z plus 1 to the um, n minus k times minus 1 to the, to the k, right? Da, 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 da. And you can study that and figure out what its radius of convergence. I mean, there is this direct method of calculation. To me, actually doing this for a specific example is ra rather daunting. I think it's a, it's a difficult calculation. But there's another way around here. See, because this isn't just any function. This is the function. It's a geometric series, right? So we also know what formula that this goes to, right? So I don't have to, I can actually, I have a workaround here because this is equal to what? This is equal to one over one minus z over two, right? Which is two over two minus z, right? Which is two over two minus z minus, well, z plus one minus one, right? Which is what? Three. Does that give me a three? I get what three minus z plus one. Does that make sense? I think that's if we go back to here and look at this. Duh. <laughs> I'm just being, you know. I'm just showing you. I'm using the same method essentially, right? This recentering trick. And but hey, that's geometric, right? So that's two thirds over one minus z plus one all divided by three, right? Which is two thirds the sum k equals zero to infinity, one over three to the k fold power times quantity z plus one to the k power. Huh. Hey, so like obviously this works out to the sum of two thirds, two over three to the k plus one. Um, times z plus 1 to the k, right? I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying that ha apparently has happened. But here's the, the awesome thing about this, is you look at this. This is only, this step is only valid for what? We need z plus 1 over 3 less than 1. In other words, the absolute value, excuse me, the modulus of 3 plus 1 is less than 3. So recentering this, my new radius of convergence after recentering is what? Three. We've gone from two to three, which is easy to understand because now we're here, right? So the, the bigger radius of convergence is this, right? Well, I, I didn't do it very well, but anyway, my picture in the notes is better. The point is, if you look at what function this is, what, what function is this really? We're really just looking at different powers. See, th this is a very special example because we actually have one sort of global, nice, closed form algebraic formula for the function we're studying. It's this. And you can easily see what the singular point is for this function. It's 2. That's the one singular point, actually, right? So if I have other singular points in the power series expansions. It's just artifact of where my expansion is centered. 
The one point which will remain as I recenter the series is this point two. I know that because I have this expression and they all have to match that. But more generally speaking, the problem just begins with a series and you're inventing a new function from just continuing the series, right? Which is, well, there you actually have to flesh that out in principle. But here's the interesting thing. If I, for example, start here, um, let me make it bigger. Suppose I start at 1, right? And then I go up here, and then I, let's see here. I can recenter it there, right? I can start here, then I'll recenter it there, I'll recenter it here. You get this so called bouquet of circles. Eventually, as you go around, oh, I should have used a different color. As you, you know, if you go around, you could come back to where you started, right? If you play this game, you can analytically continue around and you can come back to where you started. And you see, when you compare the continued thing, right, to the initial series, there's no reason why these should be equal. I mean, they can be different. For example, if I took the power series of the logarithm centered at 1, and I do this, when I get back around where I started, I'll be 2 pi i off. Analytic continuation will, will, it will, it will, it will uh, permute the, it will change the values. It, you'll continue on to the next branch is what happens. So the process of analytic continuation is also tied to that topic we talked about before, the problem of calculate, you know, finding Riemann surfaces for a function. This is, I'm, we're just we're just dipping our toes in the pond here. I mean, there there's a lot lot more to do. This is what graduate complex analysis is more about, with depending where you take it. Uh oh, uh oh. Thanks, Josiah. So here's a better picture of the example we just did, right? Um, Gamelin continues the square root function around, and he shows he gets from one square root, one branch of the square root to the other branch of the square root by continuing. All right. Um, Honestly speaking, though, guys, the only, the only way that the calculations are really nice is if you can make contact with a formula. So you don't, I mean, if you actually have to do that recentering of the series, man, it's really hard. Um, now, here's some interesting, so the, um, <coughs> like I was telling you, the points on the edge of the domain are called singular points. Um, if there's a singular point which is, you know, shared by all, different centers, I think that's what's called the natural boundary. So the natural boundary of the one I have just covered up was just the point z equals to 2. The natural boundary of this function is the whole stupid unit disk. I'm not sure what the natural boundary is of this, but at least it includes minus 1. Um, there is a vast literature studying singularities and things. There's a whole class of differential equations, which is very interesting. They're, um, if you, if you solve this complex differential equation, right, you pick any point as your initial condition. Like, so here, here's your complex differential equation. You solve it at a point. There are differential equations such that wherever you start that solution, it will exist on some disk, right? And then the whole edge is a natural boundary. So they're like, there are differential equations which come with solutions which have these like natural boundaries like that of, of, of unit disk. And these have been studied extensively uh, around the turn of the uh, 19th, 19th, well, you know, about 1900. Anyway, here's, here's a better notation for the program of analytic continuation. This gives you how to analytically continue along a path, basically. This is just instead of using a discrete number of points, this is sort of a, sort of a, con a, con a continuum idea of the same thing. Anyway, um, it's a very interesting topic. 
if you look at this, yes, I will, I will allow it. It's, it's, it's Wikipedia. It's harmless, you stupid computer. Good grief. They might ask us for money. It's the worst thing that can happen. So, I mean, it's kind of fun to look. So here, here they're actually envisioning the, you know, this is the, the Riemann surface, which is like a spiral for the logarithm. It's like a, it's like a spiral ramp. So as you, as you analytically continue, you're, you're continuing to the next, next spiral up. So, you know, because if you just collapse these all down to the complex plane, you get the multiply valued logarithm. But the Riemann surface separates those multiple values into this, this spiral, spiral ramp. But ultimately, this leads to very interesting mathematics. The monodromy theorem you should, you should read about. It's very interesting. Anyway, I will shut up. Next time, we start with Laurent series. Thanks, guys.